Welcome to Unedited, our fortnightly podcast where we explore the opportunities and challenges the retail industry is facing. Brought to you by myself, Grace Hill, and Diana Bang. From fashion, beauty, and homeware, Grace and I will cover industry topics and shed light on how retailers can create a brighter future. So Diana, how are you? What have you been up to? I'm good. I think I've just gone into like, you know, getting tired of the online shopping. So I went into my first store on Sunday, which was quite an experience with my yeah. mask. And I thought there would be like a massive queue because I can just walk to the stores from my flat. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no queue. I could just go, well, I actually had to go around to get in because there was another entrance. But it was actually, I wouldn't say it was very much different to before lockdown obviously there was it didn't feel for me that it was different it was a one-way system and there was um obviously markers and um two meters distance in the queues but it it's become so natural for me that i feel like that's just the new norm and i'm used to it so lots of lots of shopping lots of shopping i know well, well on the isle of Wight, there's not many exciting stores to visit so i'm gonna wait for that to wait for my first in-store experience until i'm back in london but i've been doing plenty of online shopping with the sales launching so i feel like the um ups or dhl delivery driver is, is has kind of a a uh, well oiled route to our house as there's new arrivals every day um so yeah definitely be making the most of the sales but I guess what are we talking about today? Yeah Grace as the impact on luxury has been at the forefront of industry news in the past three months we want to find out what's next for luxury retail. On today's podcast we have Zoe Gauntlet account director at Thread Styling. Hey Zoe welcome to the podcast. How Thanks are, for having me. Of course so how are things down in Devon? I know that's where you are right now. Yeah, good. I mean, I feel like we're just kind of getting through each day. Like work has been crazy busy. So I'm quite lucky to kind of still have loads going on, loads to focus on. But no, all good. Thank you. Amazing. And, and what are you looking forward to most now that things are kind of loosening up? Yeah, you know, I feel like there's like parts of lockdown that I actually like love and kind of want to keep. I feel like a lot of people are saying that, like just the pressure of not having to do stuff in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, but I am actually looking forward to like going back to the office a couple of days a week, just because I don't know if you guys find, but like when you're working on creative projects, it's really hard to brainstorm on Zoom. Like you can't kind of bounce off each other's like creative energy in the same way. Um, and we've reopened our studios, so like doing some shoots and stuff, I think will be fun again. And obviously, like socialising, seeing friends more. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, that's definitely amazing. Definitely. I know, same. I'm definitely looking forward to being back in the office and, and seeing Diana every day. <laughs> um, so to start off, we'd love to kind of hear more about how you got into the fashion industry and about your previous roles before you were at Threads. Sure. So um, I actually have always worked in fashion media. So after university, I actually joined um, Condé Nast on their advertising graduate scheme, um, which was an amazing experience. I worked across, obviously, you know, the big heritage titles, um, predominantly Vogue, which was a great experience. Um, and then from there, I actually moved, um, I was kind of more interested in kind of digital and I guess more kind of modern media. Um, I moved to Sherlux, um, which is a kind of online women's lifestyle magazine, um, kind of always working in content and advertising and kind of working with partners on campaigns. Um, and then from that, I moved to Hypebeast and I was at Hypebeast um, for just over two years working across their fashion partners um, and I think I was there at the time when I guess streetwear culture was really kind of taking off and becoming super yeah. mainstream so when I first started it was like a lot of partners were kind of still unsure you know all the luxury brands we were sort of saying you should be working with us and they were I guess apprehensive and then by the time I actually left we were kind of working with all of the big partners across fashion um, so that was an amazing experience and then I joined Threads back in September last year. Some very cool companies that you've worked at. Yes. Yeah we'd love to hear more about your your current role and tell us more about 
thread styling as a service and a business. On your website, it states that um, you do luxury social commerce. So what is luxury social commerce as well? Good to know. Sure, yeah. So um, I am, as Grace mentioned, an account director at Threads. Um, so I actually manage all of our content partnerships. So we have over 400 retail partners um, and I work with them on um, how we can sort of support with campaigns across our social channels, uh, direct to consumer campaigns, and also uh, work really closely with the sales team on sales strategy for those brands as well. Um, Threads as a business is quite a unique business model. So we're sort of somewhere between a retailer, a media platform, and an influencer. Um, we don't hold any inventory, so we're different to the kind of traditional retail model. And instead, um, we work with partners to fulfill orders when a client buys from us. So we're a personal styling, personal shopping service. Um, we service ultra high net worth clients who are based all around the world. Um, and we do so through social commerce, as you mentioned. So we've kind of taken that kind of luxury personal shopping experience and bought it online and made it relevant for the younger Gen Z and millennial consumer. Um, so all of our correspondence happens over social commerce. Um, our Instagram and our social channels are sort of our shop window. Um, and then from that content, it leads the audience through to a WhatsApp or iMessage conversation with a personal shopper. And then that's where the kind of full transaction takes place. So back and forth conversation about product. Um, if if a client wants to make an order we send an invoice in app so an apple invoice so you literally don't even have to leave your favorite social media apps um to kind of engage with the product wow that sounds that's, that's my elevator pitch <laughs> <laughs> well you did a great job so we know that obviously, as you mentioned, um, Threads doesn't do typical e-commerce. Instead, you state that it re it's reinventing it, which is really interesting during such an e-com heavy time. So what does this kind of involve? Um, you know, how does Threads really differ from a traditional sales channel? And you know, how do you work with luxury brands to drive sales kind of during this current climate? Yeah, so we, um, I guess the feedback we've had from clients is, they definitely want, you know, the best in luxury and fashion, but they are, you know, they're kind of busy young women. They're a lot of the time kind of first generation entrepreneurs or, you know, they're out socializing with their friends. They don't want to be sat trawling through a website and kind of hundreds of products. So I think, you know, we're working with partners to take all of that product and I guess tailor it to the client and bring it to them in a more digestible way. So we almost do all of that legwork for our clients. Um, we still work through e-commerce with a lot of our partners, um, especially during the, the past few months, um, we've pivoted pretty much 90% of our partnerships to an e-com model. So when a client buys from us, we purchase via our brand partners' e-commerce channels um, so we can access our partners' kind of global inventory um, and I guess fulfill the order directly through them as opposed to through a third party. Um, but I guess it kind of saves all of the legwork for the client. Um, and also because we're not kind of constrained by a seasonal buy, we don't have X amount of a certain colorway of a jumper that we need to sell through. Mm -hmm. We can offer a very kind of unbiased, perspective and essentially sell the client anything so we have no preference whether they buy from Fendi or Gucci we can just kind of talk about both products and, and recommend what we think would work for them and you know their shape and their you know what events they have coming up so um, I think it's kind of taking that e-commerce model one step further. It's really interesting to hear about this audience and like not having time to shop. I find even during COVID, I'm exhausted after shopping online. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we know the store experience has been really important for um, luxury consumers. How is social commerce able to maintain that experience that's highly personalized and interactive by leveraging tech? Um, what's the sweet spot between the tech and the human element? Right. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's a key um, part of our business. So as we kind of look to scale, 
we have um, invested heavily in developing our technology as a business. But I think what's very kind of core to what we do is that we retain that human relationship and that human contact. So for us, the technology has been about building um, kind of tools that make it as easy as possible for our shoppers to service as many clients as they can. But as a client, you're always going to be speaking to a real person. So we're not kind of looking at chatbots. Um, and it is very much a personal relationship that our clients have with their shoppers. So, you know, you always see shoppers FaceTiming their clients. Um, in normal circumstances, they get flown out to their homes around the world to do wardrobe makeovers. Um, yeah, so I think it, it, is, it is taking that kind of, personal relationship and, and moving it into an online setting. I think one of the major feedbacks we've had from clients is that they've done the, you know, by appointment in, on Bond Street with their parents and they just felt that, that that experience was not servicing them as a younger generation. So taking that experience and moving it to online. Mm. And surely also more scalable too, right? The fact that they're able to, you know, these personal shoppers are able to speak to more clients and service more people. And interesting that you said they obviously have to build that personal relationship with someone to be able to kind of curate and recommend products for a client based on their tastes and, and preferences that they've come to kind of learn. Um, so I guess I'm really curious, um, you know, who is the Threads clientele and, and why do you think that, chat commerce really resonates with that luxury consumer in particular so the threads client is um as i mentioned the ultra high net worth so the kind of top one percent um they are gen z millennial so it's that younger really hard to reach luxury consumer um the average age of our clients are 28 um and wow. they are but i know <laughs> so depressing <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing <laughs> i know where am i going wrong um but they are so they're based kind of all around the world we have um a very strong middle eastern client base um also apac is a kind of huge market and growing really quickly for us um, and then we've just opened an office in New York back in December um, to kind of service our US based clients um, and then obviously kind of Europe and the UK as well. I guess the main thing to know about those clients is whilst they might be kind of home residents in, um, you know, the Middle East, for example, they travel in a normal year up to kind of 30 times a year. So we're often, you know, delivering to a London address or you know, the south of France or Mykonos in the summer, ski resorts in the winter. Um, they, you know, they're kind of very much kind of living that luxury lifestyle in all aspects. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned, um, you know, 86% are female. So it's a very female focused platform, um, as I'm sure you can see from our content. Um, and a lot of them are are actually working women. So as I mentioned, first first generation entrepreneurs and business women um, who are kind of cash rich and time poor. So I guess we're sort of filling that that void for them. Oh my God, how can this be me? Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> how can I be in that one percent? <laughs> well, it's like so interesting because I know luxury brands have typically struggled with that fickle kind of Gen Z millennial um, demographic and the fact that you guys at Threads have really kind of been able to tap into that and, and service that client base so well. Yeah, and we can't ignore that. You mentioned all these regions across the world, but COVID has impacted everywhere. And it'd be great to understand because COVID has obviously thrown retail into flux. Um, a research company mentioned that each month of lockdown is causing a five to 6% dent in GDP. So from your experience, what is important to luxury brands right now and how are they adapting to the current circumstances? Yeah, I think at the beginning of uh, everything back in kind of March, when, you know, a lot of the stores started shutting all across Europe, um, I think luxury initially probably had the hardest time in figuring out how best to communicate. I think luxury brands don't have that community that maybe some of the more contemporary fashion brands have and can access um, they're more sort of aspirational so I think there was definitely the challenge of how do we kind of mm -hmm. communicate with our consumer 
in this in this time. Um, I think what we've definitely seen at Threads is that brands have kind of come to us asking to for for that kind of communication. So. I mean, one thing that, that we did, and obviously we work with so many luxury partners on a commercial and editorial basis, it was um, looking at how we can create content that is relevant to the audience now. So, you know, like everyone, we were all stuck at home. We weren't able to shoot in studios and, you know, produce our usual very kind of curated content. Um, but instead we were kind of finding really creative ways to make that work. So we were shooting on our stylists at home. Um, we were, you know, lots of kind of selfie content, mirror content, and actually it resonated really well with our consumer because everybody was in the same situation. Um, so I think actually working with our luxury partners um, to, to, I guess, present it in that way, I think it's something that is difficult for brands to do themselves because they have quite, um, strict guidelines on you know their aesthetic and, and how they present themselves um, but I think one thing that's really come through all of this is that luxury has obviously historically been very slow to adapt to the digital world and I think the pandemic has definitely highlighted the importance even more um, so a lot of brands have been reporting as I'm sure you guys know an uplift in e-commerce sales um, you know, people still want to shop despite everything that's been going on. So, yeah, I think those are the main things that I would draw from it. Definitely. And I think obviously you mentioned like luxury brands have historically been very late to the game in, in regards to adopting e-commerce and the fact that COVID has been felt hard by luxury. I know McKinsey and co estimated that global revenue for luxury goods will decrease 35 to 39% in 2020. So, how are you seeing luxury brands kind of currently evolving in terms of diversifying their sales channel to combat this? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I guess similarly to what I've already mentioned, um, luxury has definitely been kind of increasing its social presence over the past few yeah. years. Um, and I think now it's just kind of even skyrocketing even faster. Um, I think, you know, we've seen brands definitely working with influencers more mm -hmm. to kind of benefit from the communities that these influencers can offer them. Um, and then I think a big thing is, is the swipe up function on Instagram. Um, for us, it's a, it's a kind of our, our main traffic driver in terms of sales generation. So, you know, luxury brands can create amazing content and then that swipe through to e-commerce um obviously that's a massive kind of sales driver for brands um as well as publishers and influencers with kind of the affiliate models as well um for us at threads that swipe up function actually takes the consumer directly through to a whatsapp conversation with a personal shopper um which means that we can kind of own that full consumer journey so you know, I, I definitely think we've seen a lot of partners who maybe have been nervous about our tech in the past or more apprehensive to adopt it, kind of coming to us at that time and at this time and seeing, you know, how we can help them drive sales. Um, so yeah, I think, and I think it's that, that focus on ROI, so, so sales channels that they know will actually drive sales. Definitely. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm not a Gen Z person, but when you say swipe up, that's like on an Instagram story when you... Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to... Yeah, yeah, to clarify, the, the Instagram story swipe up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and do you have that with other, because I know you guys are very kind of social media, like present, like are there other functionalities on other platforms where you're able to kind of also own that journey or does it tend to remain on Instagram? So I think Instagram definitely is doing it the best at the moment yeah. of all those social channels and um, snapchat's actually a huge channel for us with our younger demographic and also mm -hmm. with our middle eastern clients because it's a very private platform um so that does really well particularly for high value um they do have there is some functionality on snapchat that helps that journey but it's not as good as the swipe up function so i think instagram kind of own the game with that at the moment um, I mean, obviously, it, we also have the APAC channels, so channels like uh, WeChat, 
in China do yeah. that really well as well. Yeah, I was going to mention about China, that's interesting. But, um, and we've talked a lot about TikTok and things like that. But what should brands consider um, when approaching those partnerships and content creation? Is there anything specific they should be wary of or consider? Um, yeah, so I guess, as I mentioned, when the lockdown started, we had to kind of very quickly adjust our content. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of, you know, pivoting our content really quickly um, and being able to shoot at home on content creators. Um, I think content aimed at the younger consumer um, naturally has kind of drawn more brands to adopt that social social first content. Um, I think in terms of what brands should consider specifically, mm -hmm. um, this word gets thrown around all the time and I guess it's sort of lost its meaning, but that authenticity and integrity, you know, not just kind of jumping on a bandwagon. Um, I guess there's, you know, brands need to definitely adapt and adopt new technologies, but I think just making sure that it's still sort of st staying true to their brand ethos and, and kind of what they represent from a content perspective. Um, I think also just looking at kind of the channels that they, they work with, now more than ever, the focus is on return on investment from content and partnerships. So looking at channels that can offer both, I mean, social is amazing at that and there are kind of other platforms as well. Um, but, you know, with kind of budgets being cut this year and you know challenges for brands to I guess leverage like events and, and other ch channels that they would maybe normally use I think um getting really creative with things and making sure it's it's kind of true to their brand guidelines I think it's interesting isn't it like you mentioned also being like that element of relatability and, and listening to the customer and really understanding what everyone's kind of going through and the fact that everybody's at home, everyone's locked down. And actually that's a way that a customer really likes to engage the fact that the brand is kind of on that same, that same platform or, or playing field. Um, I mean, that's, that's definitely what we've found. I think it does depend who your consumer is. Like if you're looking yeah. for that younger consumer, definitely. Um, you know, you might find that a slightly older consumer is looking for that escapism with the more kind of curated, yeah. highly produced content. So I think it just depends what, what kind of consumer you're after. Definitely. And I think that like leads me on nicely to my next question, because I know you guys obviously work with more contemporary brands, and then you also have your heritage luxury brands. And um, so kind of what differences are you seeing in the content that's created by each of the segments within luxury um, and kind of what is important to them? So I think contemporary brands have potentially fared better in terms of content. Um, mm -hmm. And that can be honestly as simple as the fact that they are generally smaller businesses and therefore kind of more able to adapt to instant changes that have been required. Um, I think the luxury heritage brands obviously often have like lengthy internal sign-off processes, which has made it a lot harder for them to make changes as quickly. Um, I think several kind of her heritage brands have chosen to focus on how they're actually tackling COVID head on. So um, Burberry is quite a good example. I know they've obviously been using their resources to produce um, like non-surgical gowns and masks for patients. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, from that perspective, they've almost, I guess, used their position um, for, for a more kind of global cause and, and also directly um, tackling the issue at hand. Um, I think contemporary brands also generally a slightly lower price point. So I would say to them, um, it's more accessible for a wider audience. Um, yeah. Yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah. And people talk a lot about, I guess, post COVID and what's going to happen after all this settles down, but how, from your experience, how will this change the way luxury brands communicate in the future? I mean, I think, as I mentioned, just that focus now more than ever on the importance of digital. Um, we have some luxury partners who don't even have e-commerce, which just seems crazy in yeah. 2020 um, and wow. obviously when the stores closed they had no revenue streams so I think it's made a lot of people um, kind of sit up and, and realize how important it is um, 
So I think it's just, you know, driving that digital revolution in fashion even further um, and even faster. Um, and I think, you know, more of a focus on social, obviously brands, because they're physically unable to host events and do those more kind of traditional um, forms of, you know, promotion, having to just get more creative. And I think maybe in the longer term, people will see that there are other options, other things to do around that, you know, things like fashion weeks being cancelled, all of the kind of jewellery fairs this year, like business doesn't stop. So it's how they can adapt on a kind of longer term basis to these issues definitely I feel like there's going to be huge change and it's going to be everlasting um not just in luxury but across retail in general but I think it's wild and fascinating that there are some luxury brands that still to this day before COVID didn't have kind of an e-commerce platform or, or one online yeah. um, so in t we've spoken quite a lot about um, the content that kind of resonates with, with luxury consumer. And you've also mentioned a bit about building community and in terms of how maybe luxury where they have been a little bit more aspirational, um, that it's you know, been harder to cultivate that feeling amongst their consumer. So what is important, what, so what is the importance, I guess, of community to a younger luxury consumer? And do you have any best practice or best in class examples that you could share with our listeners? I mean, I would argue that community is almost everything now for that younger Gen Z millennial consumer. Um, there are a lot of brands that do it really really well I think Glossier is a prime example not necessarily luxury but um that they're definitely all about community and working kind of with their audience um obviously I'm biased but I think Threads also really um kind of have cultivated an amazing community um over the past several years I think that is partly built on the fact that we are a consumer first business so we're because as I mentioned you know in regards to our our business model and the fact that we don't hold inventory we are able to kind of talk to, to our clients and our audience about what trends they're liking what they're seeing and and we can actually adapt our business to fit their needs um you know we rely so heavily on our community in that way about what kind of content they want to see when everything happens with coronavirus we actually posted several um stories actually asking for feedback on you know these are crazy times what content do you want to see from us um do you want to see our usual fashion content are you more interested in lifestyle um and actually listening to feedback and then tailoring our whole business on that um i think you know for luxury brands it is a lot harder to do because they don't have that kind of that relationship with that younger consumer but they're definitely it's definitely improving and they are kind of building it slowly over time you've been seeing the communities being part of the content you have like cool brands like rixo and faithful that are using their communities as part of um hashtags and styling their products but um we've spoken a lot about as well um previously on on travel you mentioned um how big part that was of the luxury consumer and we've seen in from industry sources that um, you know, the Chinese consumers represent 35% of all luxury consumption in 2019, of which um, about 70% was made while traveling, which is insane. So we know that global travel restrictions are a huge risk to luxury brands. So how can brands from your experience respond accordingly to make sure that they aren't impacted heavily by this? Yeah, so this is definitely something that um, we've been speaking to all of our brand partners about. Um, as you said, so many luxury brands rely on that international shopper and tourists, particularly in the big fashion capitals like London and Paris. Um, so we're working really closely with our partners on a strategy to kind of help to continue bring that flat, bringing that client to them um, without them obviously physically having to travel anywhere. Um, so as I mentioned, we have an amazing APAC team. They actually sit in our London office, um, but they service the whole APAC community um, and around 60% of our clients are Middle Eastern. So um, it, I think it's been kind of very natural for us in this position. Um, we're working with new partners um, to, to actually help, help them with this, 
um, this issue. Um, we also work with a lot of the flagship stores in London, um, who, as I mentioned, obviously really rely on that international traveller. So we're accessing inventory through their boutiques um, and kind of shipping it on to our, our end client who could be in China or Dubai or, you know, I guess these kind of key regions who aren't currently able to travel. So you're almost like bringing the consumer to them, uh, to those brands, even if they're not traveling, but via content, but you guys are also helping with the logistics and getting that product to them and kind of, I guess, using that inventory that may be stuck in stores um, and, and leveraging your platform to do that. Yeah, I mean, via content, but also via like our direct to consumer relationships. So, yeah. you know, to get our personal shoppers talking to clients about mm -hmm. these brands, um, you know, we create a lot of um, like gorgeous send outs that we can, that we send to, you know, tailored, we don't sort of send it out en masse, but um, if it's a particular jewellery brand, we can see from our data what clients are engaging the most with high value jewellery at the moment. So sort of sending out information to them about availability. Um, I think Key has been working with partners on product that's actually available to ship at the moment. So, um, yeah. yeah, and also the logistics side. So everything comes to our London office and then we send that to the client. Wow, amazing. Um, and are you kind of, are you seeing any particular categories that are really performing well during this crisis? I mean, I know it goes without saying across kind of mass, you know, premium across the board in retail. We've seen obviously categories like loungewear, nightwear, lingerie have all performed really well. Um, but what are you guys seeing? Yeah, so we have seen a massive increase in contemporary sales over this entire period. Um, I actually spoke to our amazing head of contemporary um, about this and she shared some figures with me. So we're actually up 80% versus last year. Um, oh, okay. Athleisure has been our strongest category. So we've sold you know thousands of units worth of kind of cozy, comfortable, but like cool fashion hoodies, sweatpants, t-shirts. Yeah. Um, we've also seen a massive increase in gym wear, so across the kind of key powerhouse brands, but also a lot of um, kind of new independent brands such as Live the Process and Ernest Leoti. Um, a lot of clients have been wanting to try new things. Um, I think that was the kind of key focus in March and April. And then when the weather improved in May, our clients definitely started buying more into dresses and basics. Um, to keep their mood elevated, but they still wanted to be really comfortable because everyone's obviously at home. Yeah. Um, so the focus over the next couple of months, I think, is a lot about kind of modern basics, so kind of matching sets and shorts, um, lots of linen. Um, and then also what's really interesting is um, fine jewellery and watches have had an incredible um, couple of months really since March. Wow. Um, we found that clients have been buying some really special pieces for themselves or as gifts um, and I think a lot of that is to do with the kind of timeless investment pieces and their longer term value um, yeah. I guess brands have kind of spent less on ready to wear designer because potentially by the time we come out of lockdown you know we'll be on to the next season yeah um, instead they've been investing in yeah those kind of, that kind of fine jewelry and, and watches which will last them forever or more that's proposals more with couples that are <laughs> doing well in lockdown yeah it's amazing isn't it that obviously you know that people aren't you know they're still wanting to invest in those kind of high value and like fine jewelry and, and watches and kind of do you see that those category categories continuing with success post lockdown what are your guys' thoughts on that yeah so um across the whole contemporary business unit we've actually been kind of actively onboarding new brands um while the whole restrictions continue um to kind of keep our clients engaged and inspired with new partners um, I think contemporary is going to remain a huge focus for our business this year. So we would definitely expect to see kind of further growth in the category at Threads. Um, and then outside of Threads, I think people have definitely been investing more in community-led contemporary brands, as I already mentioned. Um, and I think that's just going to continue to grow, um, especially following the success of brands like 
Glossier as a kind of good model for other brands. It'd be great for our listeners to know which contemporary brands um, you've been seeing that are successful during this time. Yeah, so I think it's definitely um, the the kind of luxury loungewear brands. Um, so brands like Tangaya, 90%, um, Cotton Citizen have been doing really well. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the kind of the main ones that come to mind. Definitely. I mean, Pangaya, I'm obsessed with their coloured tracksuits. I know, Zoe, you, you got one, didn't you, for yourself? To I did. I bought into on. the hype. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just couldn't decide which colour I liked the most, so I, I chickened out. Um, so we've seen uh, recently that Gucci announced that they're going seasonless by cutting their usual five fashion shows uh, in a year down to just two. So if other brands were going to follow suit, how do you see this affecting kind of luxury consumer behaviour? Yeah, I think I think in general, like people are like there is much less kind of seasonality with so many brands now, especially with like sustainability being such a focus for consumers when they're kind of looking at what brands to buy into. They want things that are going they're going to, you know, wear forever. Um, I think that it's definitely going to have a lasting impact. I would say, you know, in terms of the the kind of fashion weeks and the fashion shows, I think there's still going to be that kind of consumer appetite for newness. We definitely find that with our clients. You know, they they are whilst they are looking for those investment pieces, they always want a kind of newest, like latest, hottest brand or um you know the, the newest collection um so i i think it's kind of meeting somewhere in in the middle um i think that there definitely has been too much of a a kind of churn with these fashion brands and, and the amount of collections that they're producing um every year but i don't think that it's going to be a one and done kind of thing situation yeah and i guess to round up, because um, this is like the million dollar question, how do you see the luxury market evolving? Will COVID-19 drive much needed change or will things return to its normal state? That is the million dollar question. Um, I think that there will be some lasting changes as, as we spoke about, you know, the, the importance of, of digital and the importance of having additional ways of reaching your consumer um, I think that's going to be front of mind for all partners and you know not to be um, I guess negative but I think that whilst we're kind of coming out of coronavirus now you don't know what's going to happen in the future we don't know if it could there could be a second wave of store closures I think it's all kind of up in the air at the moment um, so I think people are really realizing that they need to make some kind of lasting adjustments. Um, and then I would say that, I guess the other thing that, that springs to mind is with regards to content, um, moving away from the kind of heavily produced glossy content as a kind of go-to across the industry and looking at more different ways to interact with the consumer and be kind of relevant for people's everyday lives. Definitely. Yeah, no, I think just embracing technology and embracing kind of innovation and, and e-commerce is, is definitely going to be extremely key, especially for this segment that has kind of lagged behind the curve. Um, so Zoe, if there's one thing that you'd want our listeners to take away from this episode, what would it be? I think the, the main thing that, you know, I've obviously mentioned so much is for brands, just that importance of who your community is and how you interact with them. Um, I think, you know, it's very easy for me to talk about it from a threads perspective. We obviously have a, a younger consumer who is, um, I guess, community is everything, but I think it's very much for brands to consider who they're targeting, who they're wanting to target and how they can kind of adapt their community in that way. So, um, you know, if you're looking to target an over 60, maybe social is not the best way to do it. Um, I think it's kind of looking at, you know, the focus for, for your business and um, staying kind of authentic to your, to your brand. Um, but also I think constantly innovating in the same, in, in the same sense. So um, keeping an eye open as to what other brands are doing and, and what's going on and, and how that could potentially work 
for you. I think for luxury specifically, like we're definitely moving away from that old school, slightly sort of stuffy attitude um, and brands are, you know, excitingly embracing a lot more changes um, and doing things that maybe even a year ago they wouldn't have considered. So I guess that's the main sort of takeaway. Yeah, it's been so insightful, um, especially you coming from with your experience between tech and luxury. So, um, so thank you so much for, for joining us today and sharing all your thoughts, Zoe. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. No, it was a pleasure. Thank you. As a listener of ours, we're here to support you during this challenging time in retail. If you're a customer of Edited, please contact your dedicated account manager and retail strategist, and they'll do everything they can to support you. For all of our listeners, please ensure you're subscribed to the Insider Briefing. You can sign up at edited.com. This is where we'll be keeping you all up to date on the latest news and strategies. Thank you for listening to Unedited. If you've enjoyed today's conversation with Zoe, please make sure to subscribe to keep in the loop with future episodes. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, then please tell your friends or family about us. And if you have any further questions, you can get in touch at unedited at edited.com or tweet us at edited underscore HQ. Bye. Bye.